Everybody needs somebody. Everybody needs a mentor. We may not know we need a mentor. We may not know that we need something, but you know who does? Church, God does. And what God does, he brings people into our lives that we need. Not that we want necessarily, but what we need. And if we allow them to work and allow God to work, thy will be done. If we allow God to do that, he can do great things. So who God is putting upon your life today may tell you what you're going to go through tomorrow, but embrace it, live it, love it, and allow God to work through you. Anthony Milas is doing a phenomenal job pastoring a church in Salem, Massachusetts. No, Salem, New Hampshire. Salem, New Hampshire. His church runs about 2,000 on eight different campuses. He's doing a wonderful job. He's going to share that. But God looked at him and he said, you have to make a change in your church. He radically made a change in his church and God supernaturally touched him and touched his church. Radically changed the New England area for the cause of Jesus Christ. Let's make Anthony... Milas, welcome as he comes and speaks. Love you, Glenville in the house, how's everybody doing today? Doing all right? If you love Jesus, put your hands together. Come on. I, I am so honored to be here. And uh, I, I've, you know, when, I, when I'm in the area, I always try to connect with Bruce, and we are great friends, and uh, I wish we lived closer together, because, you know, it's not always you get to do ministry with a brother from another mother, you know what I'm saying? And how many of you have ever seen my big fat Greek wedding? Anybody ever see that? Anybody ever see that? That's my family, okay? So we're very loud. My, my, my dad's side, they're all the Greeks. My mom's side, they're all the Italians, and I grew up in a very vocal environment, and so today, I'm going to ask you to get a little vocal with me, so if you love Jesus. Put your hands together. Come on, church. Amen. I love what God is doing in this place, and, and, and Bruce is right. The truth is, man, uh, I remember back then, we were both, you know, freshmen in college, kind of out of our elements, and your pastor's right. He really was on the dean's list, but it wasn't for academics. Trust me. <laughs> It was not for academics, and uh, Bruce would show up, and he wanted to beat everybody up at college, man. He was a wrestler, and uh, I can't tell you how many times he had me in an arm bar and stuff like that, but uh, I love this guy, and here's the deal. You know, the truth is, what God is doing here isn't happening everywhere, and, and, and I got this little saying that I love. How many of you believe that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us? How many of you believe was crucified, buried, and three days later he rose again from the dead? If you believe that, put your hands together for the Lord. Amen. Let's celebrate that today. And so, and so when, I, when I look at what the Lord has done, and I look at what God has done through your pastor here, and I'm going to talk about his amazing wife in just a minute. Um, when I look at what God has done, listen, don't tell me what God can't do, because Glenville, we have seen what God can do. Amen. Praise the Lord for that. And I love the fact that we get to be a part of this together and we get to do ministry together. As Bruce said, I, I, I pastor in New England. Uh, I'll, I'll be there 20 years in uh, this October. And went there, there was about 40 adults and uh, just a really, really uh, messy situation. I didn't know if God brought me to that church to shut it down or if God was going to show up. God decided to show up. And the truth is, to God be the glory, great things he is doing. Can a brother get an Amen. All right, and here's what's happened in the past 20 years. On the mission field called Granny United. Now, let me just tell you a little bit about my town. There's 30,000 people who live in Salem, New Hampshire. There are only two, somebody say two, two. Bible preaching churches. That's it. There's only two. Okay, and, uh, and, and so when I got there, I just said, Lord, you're just going to have to show up. You're the resurrected king who's resurrected me. And the truth is, if you don't show up, we're in a big mess. And I'm a firm believer in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, where it says, Unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that you can ask or think, according to the power that works in us. And so I said, God, you've got to do this. And so in the past 20 years, here's the deal. Man, we've not only, we not only are a church, uh, we, we, our auditorium only has 170. 72 chairs. So we have about 
2,000 to 3,000, I know it sounds like a big number, uh, two, 3,000 people that actively come once a month to our church. And how many of you know you can't get like 3,000 people in 172 chairs? How many know that, right? And, and so you got to do what you got to do because at the end of the day, we're going to depopulate hell and we're going to populate heaven because life is short, eternity is long, and people really do need Jesus. If you believe that, put your hands together, amen? We believe that. And so at Granite, we're going to do anything short of sin to get the gospel to people that we love, the people that Jesus died for. And so we're a campus, uh, a church of eight different locations. I started a church ne network. We have about 35 to 40 active churches in that. We've started from our staff and out of our chairs, from the, from the seat to the street, five independent gospel preaching churches. And, and at the end of the day, listen, the truth is God's got kingdom greatness in each and every one of us. And it's not because of who we are. It's because of whose we are. If you're saved, you know it. Say amen. amen. Man, if Jesus has radically transformed your life, put your hands together and let's just celebrate him, all right? <laughs> and at Glenville, you've been blessed. You have been blessed um, in, in, in so many ways. In, 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 anybody here love Bruce and Leslie? Anybody here love your pastors? Come on, somebody. <laughs> I mean, come on. This is absolutely unbelievable, and I, and I not only go back to uh, Bible, co Bible college with Bruce, but with Leslie as well, and, and it is an honor to see what God is doing in and through their lives, and, and again, to have a pastoral couple here for 20 years, almost 20 years, it's been over, what, 18 years, coming up on 19, that doesn't happen everywhere. This house is blessed with an amazing man and woman of God. If you believe that, say Amen. Here's what the Bible says. Let me teach you a little something, something, because I love this. I, I travel around all the New England region, up and down the East Coast, and, and I got this coaching program, and I go into churches all the time, and I try to help them do what the Bible says. The Bible says, give honor to whom honor is due. And so the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, this, is just, this isn't the message. This is the message before the message. You know what I'm saying? And uh, here's what it says in the Bible. I'll throw that verse up there, right? If the words are underlined, I want I want you to read those words with me. Here's what the Bible says. Now, friends, we ask you to what, church? Honor Who work so I want you to know one reason why Bruce and Leslie have been here for almost 20 years is because they not only love the Lord Jesus Christ, they love you. They love you. They do what they do, not only because they've been called, but they are passionately in love with you, their church. And here's what the Bible says. We have been given the next word. What's that word? We've been given a responsibility. Hey, church, let me just tell you something. When it comes to your pastors, uh, Bruce and Leslie, here's the deal. They're not only here, not only giving a responsibility of God towards you, you also have a responsibility towards them. I'm going to say this because I know preacher would never get up here and say it about himself. He's loving this. He's probably going to put me in an arm bar right after church. So I need security after church, okay? Um, you have a responsibility. You have a responsibility. And if we're not careful, having a pastor at your church for almost 20 years, and, and we will begin taking the pastor and his bride for granted. Now, I know that's not happening in this place, Amen. I know it's not happening here, but it is happening in other places. And the Bible says that we have a responsibility and, and, and given the responsibility of urging and guiding you along in, next two words. Now, now listen, your obedience and church, here's our responsibility. What are the next two words? Overwhelm them. Overwhelm them. A lot of times I go into churches, man, I have to step into messy situations. And I can say, man, because you're showing up to church and you just want to be, bless me, bless me, bless me, bless me. But at the end of the day, we need to follow the example of the Lord Jesus Christ. That I didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give my life. Somebody say amen. amen. And so the responsibility that we have to those leaders who work hard on our behalf is to overwhelm them. That's the word of God. And by the way, at Glenville, we believe the word of God and the God of the word. Somebody say amen. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for reproof, for doctrine, reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So this is the word of God today. 
And the Word of God tells us to overwhelm them with appreciation and love. And a lot of people, man, that, they get uncomfortable with that. Well, you know, are you saying the church is about the pastor? No, I'm not. What I am saying is Ephesians chapter 4 says that God gives gifts to the church, and part of those gifts are your pastor and his beautiful bride. And so I want them to stand up for a second. Okay, stand up. I'm the pastor right now. Stand up, lady. Stand up, buddy. Hey, Glenville, let's show some love for your pastor and his wife. Come on, somebody. Come on, Glenville. Show some pat. Come on, come on, come on. Show some love for the preacher and his wife. Overwhelm them with appreciation and love. Come on. All right. Knock it off. We're in church. We don't want to have it too much of a good time in church. I say this at our at church all the time. Hey, man, if you, might, if you have to go to church, you might as well enjoy it. Amen? Amen? Everybody put these two fingers up if you can. Okay? Everybody put these two fingers up. And I want you to look at somebody, and I'm going to have you do three things. I want you to look at them and say, you're awesome. Man, you're awesome. Let's do this and give them a round of applause on three. Ready? One, two, three. You're awesome. Let's do this. Give them a round of applause. Amen. I'm excited about being here, Bruce. I, I am. I actually did start a, uh, I started a timer here, so I need to pay attention to we're going to be here through, through lunchtime. All right, so here's the deal, man. I want you to pray with me. I want you to pray out loud. I do this in my church, and, and I appreciate Pastor sharing his platform and his pulpit with me. But would you pray this out loud? Just repeat after me. Everybody say, Lord, Lord. give me ears to hear, eyes to see, and a heart to receive your word today. In Jesus' name. Amen. I want to encourage you with a thought today. And that a thought is simply this. I've kind of mentioned it already. When we do the possible, God does the impossible. When we do the possible, God does the impossible. You know, you're an amazing, you're, you're amazing just because of the very fact that you're in Christ, you're in church today. I mean, you should be somewhere at a, there are no lakes around here, by the way. There's no lakes around here. There's nowhere to swim. You could be hosing yourself down at your house. It is hotter than, it's unbelievable here. I'm from New England. 106 is the, the temperature we bake goods in okay we bake cakes at that temperature it's been unbelievable but you're in church and you're in church because you love Jesus somebody say amen, amen. when we do the possible God does the impossible and the Bible says there are certain things that are impossible with for with for you to do but with God with God somebody say with God, with God. all things are possible do you believe that today I hope that you do the Apostle Paul said this, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I want you to know God will constantly call you to, to take a step, to call you to go where you're, not there, where you're not there yet. You're not there yet, okay? And I'm going to talk to you today about giving God what you do have. I'm excited about this. It's the story of the feeding of the 5,000. How many of you have heard that story before? You've heard that story before? The feeding of the 5,000 is an amazing miracle that Jesus Christ performs in, in, in his ministry. And, and the, the timing of this follows a very busy season of ministry for, for Jesus and the disciples. And we're going to pick it up. We're going to read some of it in Mark chapter 6, verse 32. Now, church, if the words are underlined, bolded, or highlighted, I want you to read them with me. Here's what the Bible says. So they got in a boat and went off to a remote place by themselves. Verse 33. Someone saw them going and, read it with me, the word got around. Okay, that's about 30% of you. Read it again. Here we go. The word got around. The word got around. The word got around from the surrounding towns. People went on foot. And what were they doing? Running. They were running to get there ahead of them. Can I just say this? Part of, our, part of our responsibility is to get the word out into our surrounding community that Jesus Christ is in this place. If you believe that, put your hands together. Come on, amen. 
And, and here's the deal. How many of you know we're living in a broken world? Come on, how many of you know that? How many of you know you're sitting next to somebody that still has issues? Come on, come on now, right? Yeah, yeah, we all got issues. We're saved by grace, thank God. But man, I thank God I'm not where I used to be, but I know I'm not where I should be, but we're on an amazing journey with Jesus. Somebody say amen. And, and here's the deal. The world is broken, we know the Bible says for all the sin to come short of the glory of God. The world, man, they're looking for hope. They're looking for help. And we know the answer. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And anyone, man, you want to get to the Father, you come through me. But Jesus Christ, he didn't come here to judge people. We all know John 3, 16, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. That whosoever, whosoever, somebody say whosoever. Believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But I love verse 17. It says, God the Father didn't send the Son into the world to condemn the world. Jesus didn't show up here to condemn us because we're already condemned by sin. For all of sin, it comes through the glory of God. The wages of sin is death. Jesus didn't come here to condemn us. He didn't come here to point a finger at us. Jesus Christ came here to do for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. It says in verse 17, God the Father didn't send his Son to the world to condemn us but that through him we might be saved. Who's thankful for that today? Amen. I'm very thankful for that. And that is the message that we get to store. That is the message of the word of God. We get to share the hope that is found in Christ. The help that is found in Christ. And the truth is, as churches all around the nation, we've got to do a better job of getting the word out so people can know that this house, the house of the Lord, this house right here, man, this is where the presence of God is. This is where the word of God is preached. This is where God shows up with God's people and lives are forever changed. Come on, Glenville. Amen. We've got to get the word out. And the more the word gets out, here's the deal. The more the word gets out, I believe God right now is working in hundreds of thousands of people's lives in this area to come to Christ. I believe that. I believe that God still draws people to himself. If you believe that, say amen. I believe that. I still believe the word of God where it says God is not willing that any should perish. I believe God wants all of our families and friends and people we don't even know to still come to Jesus. You believe that? Say amen. amen. We've got to get word out. We got to get word out that this is a house of healing. This is a house of hope. It is because, again, not because of who we are, but because of whose we are, and his name is Jesus. And I love that it says, man, when they heard Jesus was in town, they came running. They came running. Isn't that our prayer? That people would come running to the house of God to hear the word of God, to see their lives radically transformed. That is my prayer. But after this busy ministry season, you know, here's what happens. The word gets out. God's in a place. People come running. And, and, and here's what Jesus sees when he gets there. Mark 6, verse 34. When Jesus arrived, he saw this huge crowd. I mean, they just finished a busy ministry season. He sees a huge crowd, and he's looking out at the people that he came to give his life to. He's looking out at the people who he came to do something Four, people who couldn't do anything for themselves. And the Bible goes on and says, when he saw this huge crowd at the sight of them, read it with me, church, his heart broke. His heart broke. His heart broke. Hey, I don't know where you are. I don't know hardly anybody in this room today. I don't know if you walk with Christ, if you know Christ. I don't know if you're a first time guest here, but let me just tell you something. God is crazy in love with you. God's not mad at you. He's mad about you. God loved you so much that he became a man. Emmanuel, God with us. He clothed himself in human flesh. And he lived 33 years on this, on this planet. And he allowed his creation to take the creator and treat him like trash and nail him to a cross. Isaiah chapter 52 says, when they were done brutalizing the Lord Jesus Christ, he didn't even appear as a human being anymore. That's how much God loves you. His heart breaks for you. 
And as he looked out on the crowd that day, he said, my heart is breaking. My heart is breaking. They're lost. They need me. They need help. They need hope. My heart is broken. This is why I've come. As the angel said, today, uh, today, this day is born unto you in the city of David, a Savior. His name is Christ the Lord, Matthew says, and he shall save his people from their sins. Oh, don't you love Jesus today? Come on, church. Don't you love the Lord today? And Jesus looked out on the crowd and his heart broke because they were like sheep without a shepherd they were. And here's, I love this part of this, this version where it says, he went, what did he do church? He went right to work. He went right to work teaching them. He went right to work. Hey, Glenville, can I tell you something that's pretty important? When your heart breaks for people, you get to work. When your heart's broken for the lost, when your heart's broken for people who are hopeless and helpless outside of Jesus Christ, when you truly have a broken heart for the lost, you get to work. You do what you've got to do to get people to the cross of Calvary. Somebody say amen. That's our prayer. Our prayer is that we would have broken hearts and follow the example of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we don't allow lost sheep to stay lost. We don't allow lost people to travel down a road that we know there's a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. We do everything that we can to get in their way, to wave our hands and jump up and down and say, you need Jesus. He loves you. He's not mad at you. He died so that you could live through him. Come home. Come home. It's the story of the prodigal, isn't it? Isn't it the story of the prodigal when he came to his senses, he turned and he started making his way back to his father and his father had already been running towards the son. I'm so glad that Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. Here's the deal. Let me give you some good news today. When God wasn't on your heart, you were on his heart. When, you, when Jesus wasn't on your mind, you were on his mind. And he didn't send you just his word to tell you that. He didn't send just an amazing preacher to tell you that or a prophet or a priest. God demonstrated his love toward us and that why we were yet sinners. When I didn't care about God, God cared enough about me to die for me, to give his life for me. And that's why Paul said it's personal. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but the life I now live in the faith. I live by the Son of God who loved me, who loved me. Somebody say me. me. Who loved me and gave himself for me. I'm glad Jesus died for you. I'm glad Jesus saved you. But let me tell you a little something, something you need to hear today. He died for me. He gave his life for me. He loves me. He's my Savior. He's my God. And I will serve him with all I got. Come on, church. Amen. He loved me. He's an amazing Savior, and his heart breaks, and so he gets right to work. And here's how the story continues to unfold in verse 35. Late in the afternoon, the disciples came to him and said, Hey, Lord, this is a remote place, and it's already getting late. Verse 36. Here's the church's response, okay, to the brokenness of the crowd. Send the Send them away. Send the crowds away so they can go, so they can go to the nearby farms and village and buy something to eat. And I love Jesus, man. Verse 37, I write this, Jesus layeth the smacketh downeth, okay? I love this. Jesus is like, it's about to get real, boys. It's about to get real. Here we are. We're called to ministry. I've been training you for years now. I've been laying the foundation, giving you the example. And this is how you want to respond? No, 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 no. We don't play that here. And so Jesus looks at his church and he says in verse 37, But Jesus said, read it with me, you feed them. You feed them. Hey, everybody put two fingers up. Okay, a few minutes ago, you talked to one person. I want you to talk to your second choice, the person on the other side. And on the count of three, I want you to say to them, you feed them. Ready? One, two, three. You feed them. You feed them. I love that about the Lord Jesus, man. It's pretty clear, isn't it? I mean, think about the story, right? There's a lot of people. There's a lot of people in need. They're getting hangry. You know what hangry is. It's hungry people who are angry. How many know somebody when they get hungry, they get angry? Come on, they're sitting next to you. Amen. Amen. Right? I mean, these people are hangry. They're starving. 
And, and so Jesus says, we need to do something about this. And then he says, whoa, 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 hold on. You need to do something about this. And here's the option of sending them away. That's not on the table. The option of sending them away to fend for themselves or try to figure this out, that's not the option on the table. And so he looks at his church and he says, you need to feed them. You need to do something about it. It's not complicated what Jesus is asking. Verse 37 says, and this again, I love the attitude of the church, right? Verse 37, but Jesus said, when Jesus said, you feed them, here's what the church said. Read it with an attitude. Next two words. No, it's kind of like, with what? With what? He's got it over there. With what? On the count of three, and I want to see hands doing this. One, two, three. With what? Really, Lord? Excuse me, Jesus. I need you to pull up a chair here and have a seat because you're kind of missing the situation. You kind of don't understand what's going on here. You want us to do what? You, you, you want us to... Say that again, Lord, because I, I think I heard what you said. I think it was pretty clear, but maybe we just, maybe we're missing it somewhere because how in the world are we going to do what you've called us to do? Hey, I'm a firm believer in Genesis chapter 1 verse 1. I don't know about you, but in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. If you believe that, come on somebody. Amen. I believe that. We've already declared that we believe the gospel, that Jesus was crucified, buried three days later, he rose again from the dead. And now God's saying, hey, these people here, you need to do something about their situation. And the God of the universe gives a clear command, and the response of the church is, with what? How in the world are we possibly going to do that? Because, Lord, let me just help you with something. Even if, we worked for months to earn enough money to buy food for all these people. This is kind of bigger than us. Hey, I want to ask you a question. I don't want you to answer out loud. When was the last time God asked you to do something that was bigger than you? When was the last time that your faith was so stretched that God was calling you out? To do something that was impossible for you to do, but with the God of all possibilities, could be done. God's calling out his men. God's calling out his church here. They knew what they were called to do, but naturally speaking, what they were called to do was bigger than them. And so you know what they started doing? They started doing the pushback. That's what they started doing. Whoa, hold on, Lord. You want us to do what? Pastor, God told you, pa God laid what on your heart? Preacher, you need a little bit more sleep. Preacher, you're getting a little bit, hmm, losing it, preacher, right? And all of a sudden, man, God speaks a clear word, and we start freaking out and doing the pushback. Hey, can I just tell you this? Every one of our churches and every one of our lives need to be running in the lane of Hebrews chapter 11, where it says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. I just preached at the church a couple weeks ago, and I said this to them. Because, you know, they were really pushing back, pushing back, pushing back. And I said, you're all wondering where God is. My question is, why would God show up when every decision you make here, you can handle? Oh, somebody. <laughs> why would God show up here when every decision you make you can handle. Why do you need God? Make sense? Give me an uh-huh. Uh -huh. So really, Lord, you want us to do what? And I don't know about you. I feel like that sometimes. But here's the deal. What's bigger than you is never bigger than God. L let me say, because I don't think most of you heard that. What's bigger than you is never bigger than God, church. Come on, somebody. Amen. It really isn't. Not if we believe the, bio, the, the God of this book was bigger than you, is never bigger than God. He, it never is. And all of a sudden, here's the God of the universe right there in their midst, giving them clear instruction, and all they wanted to do was lean into the natural. They wanted to lean into the natural. And this is huge, and I need you to stay with me, lean in with me. So Jesus says, listen, you might not think you have all you need, Listen, but let's start with what you have. Hey, 
guys, you might not think you have all you need, but let's start with what you do have. Next verse, verse 38. So Jesus asks a pretty compelling question. He literally looks at the church and he says, how much bread? I mean, hey guys, you're freaking out. You're doing a pushback. You're telling me what's impossible. You're telling me it's bigger than you. Time out, slow your roll, player. Let me ask you something. What do you actually have? What do you have? And they're like, um, hey, hey, Andrew, what do you got? Hey, Peter, what do you got? Hey, uh, they're like sitting there, and they don't have a clue what's going on. And so Jesus gives another clear word, and he says, hey, he asks, and listen to this. He says, read it with me, go and find out. You're so focused on what you don't have, you've overlooked what you do have. You're so focused on the thing that's bigger than you, that you've forgotten I'm standing right here with you. You with me? And I love this because Jesus is like, you're freaking out and you haven't even taken inventory yet. You haven't even slowed down yet to see what you do have. You're reacting instead of responding. You need to slow down and you need to look at what you do have. I tell people all the time, man, I, I'm a Facebookaholic. I don't know anybody else, but my name is Anthony Miles, and I'm addicted to Facebook. I'm just telling you, I love Facebook because, man, we have thousands of people in our church, and for me, it's an opportunity to speak into a lot of people's lives, and, but I got negatrons in my church, negatrons. Like, I don't even need to go to their Facebook page, and I can tell you their post says something like this, we'll never make it, we're going to die, whatever it is. I call them negatrons, you know, and I'm constantly like, come on, man. The Bible says, man, forget not all his benefits. You are blessed in Jesus Christ. You are more than a conqueror in Christ. You once were dead, but now you're alive. Come on, church. Stop looking at what you don't have. We're blessed. Man, we win. We win. And I love the part that as a, of what the disciples saw as a problem, Jesus just saw as an opportunity. What's your opportunity today, Glenville? What is your opportunity? I remember one time, a lady coming to our church, she's an amazing, amazing woman of God, but she had just given up on her husband. 26 years, 26 years, she kept trying to share faith, trying to get her husband to come to church. He went to a church here, went to a church there. No, she finally comes to Granite. You know, we're kind of smaller there. She says, yeah, but, but my husband, he'll never get saved. And I said, whoa, as long as he still has a pulse, as, still, as long as his heart is beating, he is topsoil. God's not done in his life. Amen. And we started begging God for his soul. And that man gave his life to Christ. He fell on his face. He weeped. And now he leads an entire campus of host team leaders. Isn't that great? Don't you dare. Listen. Don't tell me what God can't do. Because we have seen what he can do. And if God can say to a man named Lazarus, Lazarus, come forth. Jesus is bigger than anything we're facing. So he sees an opportunity. He says, what do you have? Mark chapter 6, verse 38. Let's, let's keep going. Here's what the Bible said. How much bread do you have? He asked, go and find out. They came back and reported, we have, read it, five loaves of bread and two fish. You know, I kind of, when, when I teach this passage to leadership teams, I always lean into this because I wonder how hard they really did work. You're telling me, you know, the commentary, the commentary say there's like 20,000 people here, right? 5,000 men, not counting women and children. And you're telling me, I send 12 of you out and you come back with one lunch. I really, how much effort did you really put into this? You ever think about that? 20,000 people, you just found one lunch. If I was Jesus, I'd be like, throat punch. I'm just telling you. We'll talk about it when you wake up. And uh, <laughs> you, what, you're rolling up here with a little boy's lunch, and there's 20,000 people. You, that's all you can do. That's like the best that you got. But here's the deal. 
Hey, little becomes much when God is in it. Somebody say amen. Because God was not going to be limited, limited by their lack of faith or effort. All he needs is a seed. All he was looking for was a seed. And so here's what happened. So, so they sat down, or verse 39, then Jesus told the disciples to have the people sit down in groups on, a, on the green grass, verse 40. So they sat down in groups of 50 or 100, verse 41. Don't miss this. This is the key. This is key. If you, if you haven't listened yet, listen to this part. This is the key to what God wants to do in your life. So Jesus, read it with me, took the five loaves and two fish. He looked up toward heaven, and what did he do? Then, 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 don't miss that. That is a huge word in the text. Then, somebody say then. then. Look at the person next to you and say then. Say, 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 say then. Then, breaking the loaves into pieces, he, read it with me, kept giving the bread. Little boy's lunch, and he kept giving and 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 giving. And giving and giving and giving and giving and giving and giving. He kept giving the bread to the disciples so they could distribute to the people. He blessed, he gave it to the church so the church could meet the community's need. By the way, Ephesians chapter 3 verse 20 talks about we saw the God infinitely more, right? Exceedingly, abundantly. But God's plan is to do something great in and through this church for the community. You, we are the body of Christ. Amen. So he gives it to the church. They distribute it to the people. He divides the fish for everyone to share. Verse 42. Let's read it. It says as they all ate as much as they wanted. All right. Let me land the plane a little bit for you. This is huge. Because for some of us, we've been in Christ for so long, we forgot what it's, what it's like to walk in faith. And for some of you, you may be new to Christ. And you're like, man, what do I do next? God's going to call you to a step of faith. For some of you sitting here today, you're going to hear in a few minutes that Jesus Christ is the bread of life and living water. Do you believe that, church? Do you believe that? That Jesus is the ultimate thirst quencher. Everything that you're looking for out in the world, listen, you don't find it in the world. You find it in the word. Amen. Thank you, sir. Amen. We believe that. Here's the deal in the passage. Jesus never asked the church to give him what they didn't have. Jesus never asked them to give what they didn't have. He asked them to surrender what they did have. Somebody say, hmm. <laughs> Jesus will never ask you to surrender what you don't have. But he looks at you today and says, what do you have? Are you willing to surrender? Are you willing to surrender it? And by the way, after, somebody say after. After, after what they had given to Jesus, after the surrender came the blessing. That's huge. I talk to people all the time, man. All the time. It's what we do as pastors. We talk to people. I'm just waiting for God to show up. He's already shown up. Well, if, when I get more time, you already have time. When, when we get enough, you know, our financial you No, you've already been blessed with finances. When, when, I, when I sharpen my skill a little bit. No, no, no. You've already been given a gift. When I'm blessed, no, 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 no. The blessing always follows the surrender. We reap what we, oh, you've heard it before, right? And yet sometimes we think that's such a negative verse. It's not a negative verse. Why can't that be positive? To whom much love is, you give much love out, you receive much love, amen? I mean, you know, that's just the way it works. It doesn't have to be negative. But I want you to know in the passage of scripture, this is huge for our churches. Man, the blessing comes after the surrender. Way too many people are waiting for the blessing. When, when, and then they say, well, when the blessing happens, I will surrender. No, no, no. They're, they're what I call, I'm the, a part of the I would gang. But Jesus isn't, you're already blessed. 
Somebody say, I am blessed. Say it with me. I am blessed. I am blessed. I am totally righteous in Christ. I mean, think about that. And there are churches all around the nation full of the I would gang, and Jesus is looking for the I will gang. Well, I would. Well, I would. Well, I would. No, no, no. no. You got to transition I would to I will. Because it is only after the surrender that the blessing comes. If you're tracking with me, somebody say amen. amen. See, I love how the story ends. Verse 43. And afterward, and afterward, the disciples picked up how many? Well, and I'm sure preachers spoken on this here before. To how many disciples were there church? Twelve. How many baskets were left over? Twelve. And all of a sudden he looks at this guy and says, Hey you, Mr. W with what? What are we going to do? Oh Lord, you don't have a clue. This is bigger than us. Hey you, Thomas, Peter, Matthew, you guys. Hey, there's a basket for every one of you, but it's not yours. I want each and every one of you to grab that basket. And here's what I believe. I believe Jesus allowed the boy who lived furthest from that point to give his lunch. So that these guys, every one of them could pick up a basket and say, Are you kidding me? You're dumb, Peter. Oh, I can't believe you didn't trust Jesus. What were you thinking? Why were you, why were you so critical about? Why did you question him? And they're walking with their baskets and they're sweating. And all of a sudden a little boy opens up the door, walks inside mama's house. And there's one basket, two baskets, three baskets. You want to know why? Because we serve the God of the overflow. Do you believe that today? We do. We serve a God of the overflow. Twelve baskets of leftovers of the bread and fish. Verse 44. A total of 5,000 men and their ne next two words. Amen. We're fed. Don't tell me what God can't do. Because we know what God can do. Amen. For some of you, you sit in church week after week after week after week after week. And you're waiting for that magic moment. This magic moment. <laughs> We're waiting for that magic moment. Let me tell you something. There is a God. It isn't you. How many of you know the person sitting next to you is not God? Come on, raise your hand. Survey says. Yeah. There is a God. It isn't you. And he's giving clear instruction. And for some of you, you're just waiting for that magic moment. And God said, really? See, the blessing comes after the surrender. There's a community who's lost, dying without Jesus Christ, and they need to be fed the bread of life. They need to be served living water. They need Jesus. And so God looks at all of our Bible-preaching, Christ-exalting churches and said, you feed them. You feed them. How are we going to do it? Start with what you have. You do have the time. You do have the finances. You do have the gifts. You do have the abilities. Because God himself says, what know ye not your body is a temple of God? Because you have Jesus. Don't tell God what he can't do. Decide what you will allow him to do. For some of you today, Jesus loves you. I told you that earlier today. This is a picture as Jesus took the bread and he broke it and he broke it and he kept giving it out and giving it out and giving it out and giving it out and giving it out where the Bible says for God so loved the world you're included not excluded and God's not mad at you. He's the bread of life and he was broken and there's plenty of bread for everybody in this room everybody in Wichita everybody in this world if you believe that say amen. But you're trying to figure this out. No, no, no. Salvation happens when you surrender. And then you're given a clean heart and a brand new start. You're trying, you're trying, you're striving for something on, that only comes after you surrender to Christ. There's somebody in here today that if you were to step into eternity this afternoon, you're not sure that heaven's your home. 
Why not today? Why not right now? Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. No one's looking around. Now listen, this is a big deal. Jesus loves you. He is the bread of life and he is living water. And he has been broken so that you can be made whole. What would keep you today from surrendering to him? There's somebody in this room right now. You're like, man, I just prayed this prayer before and I prayed, you know, did this, did this. Listen, if you're really struggling, let me tell you this. That's the Holy Spirit speaking into your life. The devil will never get you to question your salvation. He'd rather you believe in a counterfeit confession. But the Holy Spirit's like, hey man, today's your day, sweetheart. Today's your day. Today's the day you cross the line of faith. This is it. And if you're ready to do that, I want to help you. The Bible says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be without a doubt forever saved. And if you're ready to give your heart to Jesus Christ, I'm going to just lead you. I'm going to come by your side spiritually and lead you into prayer. You don't have to pray out loud. God is here. He's in this place. He knows your heart and he wants you just to surrender to him today. So pray something like this. Dear Lord, pray it in your heart. Dear Lord, right now, I am surrendering my life to you. Right here on this Sunday morning, I confess to you, Jesus, that I need you. I know that I'm a sinner. And today, I am confessing you to be the Savior, not only of the world, but my Savior. Thank you for dying for me. And thank you for saving me today. With heads bowed and eyes closed. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to make you stand up, speak up, or come up. But I want to celebrate with you today. In the privacy of this moment, if you prayed that prayer, you said, Preacher, you know what? No more games. I'm not worrying about the person behind me, next to me, in front of me. I, you know what? Today I did business with God. Today I crossed the line of faith. Today I asked Jesus Christ to be my Savior. That when you were praying, I prayed and I asked Christ in my heart. On the count of three, all I want you to do is raise your hand. With heads bowed and eyes closed. Ready? One, two, three. Nice and high. Nice and high. Wow. Keep them up. Keep them up. Just keep them up. I won't embarrass you. Wow, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. There, God bless that. Put your hands down. Just put your hands down. Wow. Hey, listen, listen. Those of you that bowed your that just raised your hand. In a moment. I too many too many hands for me to count today. Here's the deal. The truth is, if you did embrace Christ as your Savior today, the Bible says you've been given a clean heart and a brand new start. Welcome to the family of God. For some of you, it's an issue of eternal security. In a few minutes, somebody's going to come up here. I think it's Al's going to come up here. And we're going to talk about a next step. We want to have a conversation with you. We don't want you to take my word for it or the church's word for it. We want to make sure you got God's word on it. Hey, everybody look up here. If you call Glenville your home, celebrate with all of these people today. The celebrate with all of these people today. Woo! Wow! Hey. That is amazing. Amen. If you raise your hand in a few minutes, please don't run. I don't know if you come here normally or if you're just a guest here or maybe you're kind of new to the church. If you cross the line of faith today, there is no better church in this area than Glenville to, to grow your faith in Jesus. Amen, church? Amen. And so, man, just, just hang around, have a conversation. Last thing, and I'm going to shut up, preacher. He's looking at me like, come on, man. I'm going to put you in a submission hold. And uh, here's the deal. This is huge. That little boy who surrendered, hey, guess what? 2,000 plus years later, we're still talking about his story. Because he drew attention to himself to bring glory to God. And you know why we're talking about his story? Because he surrendered not what he didn't have, he surrendered what he did have, have to Jesus. If you're sitting here today and you call Glenville your home, listen, and you're not in a ministry, it's time to get in a ministry. This church is going to just take it to a whole other level come the fall. And we need all hands on deck so that we can love people for Jesus. Amen? Amen. So you need to do that. Sign up for a ministry. <laughs> hey, if you're not giving, and I'm going to say this. Preacher hasn't said anything about giving, but I am going to. 
If, amen. If you're not giving, if you're not giving, man, listen, you need, you need to surrender that area of your life. You cannot outgive God. And we're not talking about an infrequent giver. The mission that God has called this church to is 24-7 every day of the year. Amen? There are missionaries that, that we've made promises to. There are ministries. There are, there's the next generation that we're investing in. Don't be a taker. Be a giver. And if you're not a giver, man, I don't know what your systems are here, but go on the website, sign up, become an electronic online giver, become a recurring giver, because the mission of Jesus Christ is fueled by the faithfulness of God's people. Do you believe that today? Amen. And here's the last thing. Don't tell God what he can't do, because we have seen what God can do. What is it today? That you've been doing the pushback on Jesus with. What have you been pushing back on? On the other side of that surrender is blessing. Don't miss what God wants to do in and through you. He'll take a couple, <laughs> a couple guys on the dean's list at a Bible college and scratch your head and wonder what they're doing here. It ain't much, Lord, but it's yours. And he'll do something great and through them, not because of who they are, but because of whose they are and who he is. Amen. Amen. Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord, for the day we've had in church and for your word. Thank you that we get to see all of these people raise their hands today, God. I, I, Father, I pray that they would just step up and step out and just say, hey, today I pray. Today I pray with the preacher. Today I just surrender. Today I'm all in. Whatever that is, God, I, you're doing something. I pray, Lord, that you continue to have your will and way. Thank for this amazing church. Thank for Bruce and Leslie, Lord. I just pray you continue to bless them and their amazing family, their, uh, their family, God. And Lord, for this church family, God, help us to have a broken heart for the lost and do what you've called us to do. You are the great I am, and we believe in you, we trust you, we love you, and today, fresh and anew, we surrender ourselves to you. We pray these things in Jesus' name, and all God's kids said, Amen. let's celebrate what God's doing today, church. Amen. God bless every one of you. Thank you.